Coming up in this week in computer hardware, Pixel 3, Google Home Hub, and a slate, three new Intel CPUs, Project Unicorn Vomit gets an SSD, and a gaming headset that cools your ears. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 487, recorded on October 11th, 2018. Pixel 3 and three new Intel CPUs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today for three months free with a one-year package. Go to expressvpn.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, most unhinged, most useful... Well, news and reviews of PC hardware. We love mobile. We love laptops. We love phones. We love the Internet of Stuff. I'd use another word, but this is a family podcast. And joining me now is a family kind of guy, Mr. Alan Malventano of PCPer.com. Welcome, Alan. Hey, you're like putting me on some kind of family man pedestal there. Yes, I don't know. you are a family man. You and your okay, wife and your cats. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the stories today and I, I feel like there are two kind of big sets of announcements that are going to dominate the show. One of which, uh, oddly enough is from Google and, uh, Google uh, dropped several things, uh, dropped something else they didn't bother to mention. And, um, you know, uh, and we also have some parts from Intel, are you excited yeah, yeah, yeah. about the Pixel 3? Are, are you in the market for a phone? Are you comfortable with your, your your phone lifestyle at this point? I mean, I'm I'm like, what, two generations ago now on an iPhone? <laughs> I've got like, got like an 8. Like, I'm, I'm happy, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's a phone. It does phone things. I'm okay. It takes pictures when I need to. Uh, <laughs> Pixel 3 looks cool, though. Um, yeah. They, they, they seem to be borrowing some design aesthetics from <laughs> that I'm familiar with from seeing like a year ago, you know, like well, with the whole notch in the top there and stuff. It's been funny to watch people react like, you know, well, this notch has a point, not like that other notch. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, goodness. I, I guess it's a I big notch, though. Um, yeah. The, uh, well, it's got the Google system looks in good, it, right? Mm hmm. No, yeah. the cameras, I no. mean, the the cameras, I think, are probably, as always, kind of the, the big, uh, uh, I guess, the big push, the big point, kind of the most exciting thing uh, in terms of changes. Um, you know, not that there's anything. I just, I find it difficult to get super excited about specs on phones at this point in terms of the yeah. processor, um, simply because, uh, uh, simply because, uh, you know, everything's so fast. Like you have to have some pretty challenging apps, you know, to challenge it. You've uh, Snapdragon, you know, 835, 845. Like this is Snapdragon 845, four gigabytes of RAM, um, clearly white, just black, not pink. Um, Shannon's really excited because it has a uh, stereo or I should say dual front firing stereo speakers, which is invariably one of the things that drives her nuts because most of the speakers on most phones are so atrocious. Um, Bluetooth 5.0. The active edge sensors, which if I understand correctly, you can sort of squeeze the phone to bring up Google Assistant, which I find slightly terrifying. Um, <laughs> hmm. A wireless charging stand if you're into that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to look at these kind of side by side because if you go into the tech specs on the, the Google Pixel 3 website, they have sort of the Pixel, the Pixel 2, and the Pixel 3. Um, and the design aesthetic hasn't particularly changed a lot. They've just sort of cleaned it up. But... Uh, it's it's interesting to sort of, you know, they still have the, you know, the button in the back, the cameras, camera notch is pretty interesting on the XL. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I'll be very curious to see that when Shannon gets hers in. Um, you know, the camera, as always, like I was starting to say before, um, certainly seems to be a big part of what they've done. But it, a lot of it seems very incremental to me. Um, nothing super huge in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, there's nothing at this that makes me go, Z-O-M-G, this changes everything, um, which yeah. is not exactly, I think, where we are at with most phones at this point. Um, I mean, it, 
it's okay. It's okay to be incremental. You don't always have to be groundbreaking. You just, you know, then you'll, whoever the people are that need a new phone at this moment in time, right. they'll just get the Pixel 3 instead of the Pixel 2, right? You know, <laughs> sl slightly newer hardware, slightly better specs. Uh, right. A, a notch they may or may not like. Who knows? You know, machine learning software so, uh, that's supposed to... Oop, go ahead. Yeah, so it's... uh, Yeah, there's the AR stuff. Mm -hmm. Which I'm yeah, guessing the, is what the second front camera helps with. Yeah. Trying to do AR with, like, <laughs> selfies. It's funny. One of the complaints I've read from from a lot of the early responses is that it's only got four gigabytes of RAM, and a lot of the flagships have six gigabytes. There's some definite concern about the battery size on this. Um, the the new uh, OLED screen um, is pretty spectacular by all counts of everybody who's seen it uh, up close. And you know, I mean, they're looking to kind of keep their lead in terms of having the best or one of the best. Uh, um, cameras out there and and the other thing is that their idea is that they're going to be doing sort of more at the back end you know it's a 12.2 megapixel camera uh two front facing eight megapixel camera um there's the actually literally a second selfie camera which is part of why they have the notch on the xl because they have two cameras that are facing you um set up the second camera set up for wide angle selfies um so, uh, you know, I'll be very curious to to hear Shannon's response. She's going to go side by side between the, the Pixel 3 XL and the Pixel 2 XL. Um, and she's extremely obsessed with the cameras, uh, which I think is kind of a good thing. Still no headphone jack. It's gone. <laughs> yep. Uh, you Not know. coming back. Boy Genius Report had a particularly cruel... Uh, uh, title Chris Smith wrote up at uh, BGR.com. Quote, the Pixel 3 won't help the fact that Google just can't seem to sell Pixel phones. Which I thought was harsh. Oh, uh, Samsung's kind of trolling them. Uh, uh, Samsung's certainly trolling Pixel over the notch, or Google over the notch in the Pixel. Um, you know, this is... Uh, uh, and then in another year or two, you'll see a notch on a Samsung phone, I'm sure. You know, you know. I, I'm I'm curious. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, Google Home Hub, uh, you know, we've seen a bunch of devices out there. Uh, Lenovo came out with one, um, particularly nice looking 10 inch screen. They also have an eight inch version of that. Um, this is the sort of the similar uh, version of it from home. And, uh, you know, so like a lot of the Google products, uh, it'll do voice match. So, you know, if I, you know, say good morning, it's different, like different response is say, if my wife says good morning, um, you know, you can, Hey Google, good night. Like I love the, sort of the automation that they're doing on there. Um, you know, is it, and um, it's, is it, is it able to link with like, so say, you know, it recognizes you and your wife separately. Does that mean like if she sets a, an appointment or something, it goes on her calendar, not yours. Like, that's how it's supposed it, to work. Yeah. Okay. Deep integration with that's Nest. Cool. Um, you know, the idea that you're going to be able to sort of see everything that's going on in your house and get a summary of that on the page. Um, Google Assistant, obviously. The uh, um, the like uh, a photo frame. Yeah, cool. you know, $149. The pricing is is pretty good. I'll be curious to hear what it sounds like um, because, you know, I am an audio geek. But... Uh, you know, uh, I, I love the, you know, the thing that we keep seeing from all of these is like, it'll give you, you know, super awesome answers with visual it, compliments. Yeah. When yeah. you ask it for a recipe, which always makes me think of like, you know, people trying to Radio Shack trying to sell trash 80s um, back in the 80s, TRS 80s, uh, you know, a thousand years ago where mom could organize her recipes like that, you know, now it's not, mom can organize the recipes, but you can be like, hey, I need a recipe for this. Um, in a YouTube videos on there, which I think they, they mostly are making a big deal out of just to poke, uh, uh, poke at a, a certain Amazon. <laughs> and then they're, getting, they're throwing in uh, uh, six months of YouTube premium when you buy it. Yeah. They're, they're uh, you know, they're doing like uh, six months of free music on the Pixel 3, six months of yep. uh, YouTube preview on the Google Home HUD. Uh, Pixel Slate looks interesting. Um, it's her first tablet in a long time. Um, it uh, is not inexpensive. Um, That's true. So I want to say it starts bucks. at like, yeah. Well, it starts at 600 bucks, and then as you start adding things on, it gets more and more expensive. That, that $600 version is four gigabytes of RAM, 32 gigabytes of storage, uh, uh, or eight gigabytes of RAM. 
And so, well, basically, the entry level is five hundred ninety nine dollars for a Celeron processor, four gigs of RAM, thirty two gigs of storage. Um, you know, by the time you step up to something like a Core i five or a Core i seven, you're looking at a thousand to sixteen hundred dollars uh, with eight or sixteen gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, so, the keyboard's two hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. That's pretty steep. Yeah, so you know, a six hundred dollar. If you want a keyboard, a six hundred dollar tablet becomes an eight hundred dollar tablet. You know, the yeah. Thousand becomes a twelve twelve hundred dollars. Um, twelve point three inch display, uh, power button and fingerprint sensor integrated. Um, it looks pretty clean. It's like seven millimeters thin. Um, the uh, huge number of almost too many. Pro- yeah, they they've got like a different processor RAM storage combination at like every price point, which I guess is kind of obvious. Um, but. Uh, I'm curious to see how this goes over. Um, you know, I'm also curious to see what the performance is like on that entry level model. Um, you know, I do love, you know, Chrome OS, you know, in terms of like office or, or managing students, Chrome OS is fantastic because it's fairly secure and they do a pretty good job of keeping it updated. Um, uh, despite the best efforts, uh, of some users, but, uh, uh, you know, I wish the keyboard wasn't so expensive. So Yeah, that just seems really steep even compared to mm-hmm. pretty much anything else I can think of. $200 yeah. for a tablet keyboard is definitely up there. Um, um, what else did they launch? They you launched, know, they didn't uh, actually... Well, they updated, right? Yeah, the Chromecast. Um, yep. It's funny, there's a particularly brutal... Uh, uh, Sasha Sagan, PC Mag, uh, runs sort of the mobile department of PC Mag, and uh, I, he was over at the event, I'm sure, for the Pixel Three. Uh, but uh, yeah, I put this into sort of the harsh but fair category. "Quote: Google didn't talk about the new Chromecast at its Pixel event because it's a failed idea. The company needs a new TV approach stat, which should maybe include a Roku acquisition." Um, and it was funny because I was looking for information on this, and you can buy one right now at Best Buy, but you can't actually find. Uh, much in the way of information on the website. It wasn't really, again, they didn't really talk about it in the announcement. Um, but the big change, they're talking about a, a 15% boost in performance, um, you know, kind of a cleaner design, uh, just a simple hockey puck with a letter on it, um, the letter G on it. Uh, 60 frame per second video at 1080p, which is a step up from 720p on the previous generation. And they're bringing in, uh, well, later this year after a driver update, um, they're going to give you the ability to uh, uh, do, you know, whole house audio or, or basically make it behave like a Chromecast audio um, and play the same music as other speakers uh, inside of there. Um, you know, 35 bucks, you still stream app by app. Um, you know, the Ultra is going to be around yeah. because this one doesn't do 4K uh, and it's going to sell for 35 bucks. Um, I'd get one in for, you know, I'd buy one to review it, but I'm not sure what the point is. Because it's either going to do 1080p 60 video or it's not. Um, right. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's it's funny. I, I like, uh, you know, one of the things that, that Sasha says uh, in his essay, his, his opinion piece, um, is, is that the idea of controlling your television with your phone is kind of a failed idea. Um, you know, and that people want simple things like remote controls that work, uh, which would bring me to... Uh, the latest version of the Cavo, uh, <laughs> which I'm actually doing a review on uh, an AVXL this week, um, which takes away one of my favorite features from the $400 Cavo, but it also costs 100 bucks and, and works uh, functions somewhat more better, to say the least. Uh, did you guys uh, did you guys talk about uh, Intel's? Uh, uh, well, I guess uh, the ninth generation processors, like on on the podcast yesterday. Yeah, yeah, we covered uh, actually a whole slew of things uh, that were announced. Uh, review embargoes are not up yet um, on them, so we're still taking a look at stuff here, uh, mm-hmm. testing away. Actually, I think there's some testing going on uh, over my shoulder to the right here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, not really a surprise on these particular CPUs because we've kept hearing like tidbits here and there right. on them, but now they're officially announced. Um, i9 9900K and the i7 9700K. So both of them are eight core parts. The the i9 series, and I have an i9 that's going to be a like a desktop part, right? Um, right. And uh, 
prices are a little bit steep, right? You put, you know, it's going to be actually the prices are being gouged right now on like pre-orders. You're <laughs> talking like upwards of six hundred dollar pre-orders for uh, for that part, but supposed to be closer, probably to five hundred uh, once things stable out. Um, but eight core, sixteen thread part, um, supposed to boost up to five gigahertz. So it's supposed to do, um, you know, that was like the i7-8086, like that limited edition part was supposed to be like, ooh, fancy, you know, 5 gigahertz part, which uh, it was hit or miss, right? Like some reviewers, uh, when they tested that part, were not able to hit 5. So we're hoping right. that this part actually will uh, without having to specifically overclock it. Um, Things should be a little bit better, though, because they shifted to a... I'm not sure if you, if you already went past that picture, but they shifted to a soldered um, thermal interface. In other words, instead of there being thermal paste underneath the heat spreader, uh, there's mm -hmm. an actual... Like, they actually solder it uh, to the processor die, which helps with heat transfer because it's just a, a more solid interface. Um, you know, and uh, just straight metal uh, tends to conduct heat a little bit better than... The thermal paste that they happen to stick under there, like there was just a whole swath of folks, like like a wave of people suddenly interested in delitting their CPU because you know you, you ended up giving up a few degrees just to the interface right. to even get to your heatsink, right? Um, so it should be interesting. Uh, there's also some uh, something I'm very interested in, uh, just from my background, is that there is. Some improvements to the mitigations of Spectre and Meltdown with these parts. Really? So, yeah. Uh, we don't know, like, how it plays out in real, like, real testing and real world applications just yet. But, right. um, you know, there there are, they're not all mitigated in hardware, but the, the different variants of Spectre and Meltdown, um, you know, some of those variants are uh, in hardware. Again, what that what that means exactly for like performance? Does it completely make it as if there was never a performance in the first place? Probably not. Um, right. But it, I would imagine that it helps uh, compared to you know the situation we were in before, which is once those patches came out and people were seeing uh, some performance hits on specific types of applications. Um, you know, we'll have more info on that uh, when when the reviews go up. Um, there were some other. Uh, Stuff on the site recently related to that. Um, well, the Z three ninety, which is, I guess yeah. you know, I mean, it's a, it's 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 like a three seventy um, with support for up to six. I want to say USB three point one Gen two uh, ports. That's ten gigabits per second. Uh, that's and they're the major building difference an with this. AC wireless. Um, yeah, yeah. So the eight hundred two eleven AC wireless, uh, it, even though it's there, it's like optional, like. It doesn't have to be a thing that's enabled by, mm -hmm. you know, depending on whether or not that board maker wanted to make that a feature of that particular motherboard, right? right. Um, uh, so chipsets capable of it doesn't mean that it's it's always there no matter what. Um, USB 3.1 Gen 2 is probably going to be used by everybody, um, which is good, right? Uh, and I, I was actually... Uh, we were kind of chuckling about it during the podcast because if you scroll way down to like where the back plate is... On mm -hmm. on that, uh, I initially was wondering, well, which one of those uh, three different USB 3.1 uh, labeled ports is actually Gen 2? Well, as it turns out, they all are. <laughs> so, if, you know, if you see a red port or a Type C port on a 390 board, uh, chances are it's it's just going to be you know Gen 2, and and that's the difference for people wondering is it's capable of 10 gigabits instead of 5 gigabits. So you're you're doubling your throughput again um, on something that was already, you know, reasonably fast, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a uh, serial ATA is 6 gigabit, you know, USB 3.1 Gen 1 was 5 gigabit, pretty close to that speed um, of, of a good SATA SSD. Um, and now you're doubling that. So that's good. I'm just trying not to make red shirt jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of red ports. Um, the red what port else do we have? Does. Uh Oh, yes. Uh, next up is sort of an interesting thing. Uh, how about a 28-core Xeon in a workstation machine? 
I see no issues with this, uh, except yeah, for the so price. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Remember that demo that Intel had the crazy cooling on the 28 mm -hmm. core part that they were going to talk about, like for workstation use and, and things like that? Well, this is that actual part, uh, minus the crazy cooling, but not going the same uh, speed, right? right? This is not going to be like, it's not going to go five gigahertz on air or anything crazy like that. Um, not with all 28 cores. But uh, 4.3 turbo frequency, not not bad, right? Um, but they uh, but they are talking about if you look at the verbiage underneath the processor details, which I think you passed. Um, 600 megahertz base clock, or that sorry, uh, the advantage is 600 megahertz on the base clock and another half a gigahertz on Turbo Boost 2.0 clock over the comparable Xeon, like the regular server side Xeon. So that's a pretty big jump over the server part, um, mm -hmm. you know, for a workstation part. Uh, now, as far as uh, like where you can plug this in, uh, I think it's just going to be like one or two motherboards are going to support this guy. Um, <laughs> one from Asus and I think one from Gigabyte. So it's, you know... It's it's not exactly. It's gonna be. It's like a niche of a niche, from the right. sense of it. Um, yeah, and those workstation boards are just gonna be like these beastly things. So it's basically like you want a server, but you want it on your desk. You know, <laughs> get this thing right. Um, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be pretty insane. Um, but again, probably not a lot of volume being sold. But it's definitely you know as far as flagships go, like. It's a pretty good flagship, 28 core. Basically, 28 core Xeon just sitting on your desk. Um, sitting on your desk, waiting to process. <laughs> waiting to, yes, waiting to pro probably, unless you're really throwing stuff at it, probably just waiting to process. Yep. So, yeah, a bunch of Intel, you know, CPU stuff and small update with the chipset stuff coming up. But again, they're all sort of announcements for the moment. The reviews, I think we have another like week on. Um, you know, before we'll see actual results. I was, uh, so we talked about the big Bloomberg story. The original story is essentially that, um, uh, positing that Supermicro had, uh, China was hacking U.S. businesses by Supermicro, by putting chips on Supermicro motherboards. Um, some interesting responses to that, like, uh, People on Twitter quoting at me, well, so-and-so says it may be a fake story. Well, yeah, it may be a fake story. Um, it's also uh, it had a lot of uh, – I also realized that, that the, one of the people who tweeted at me hadn't actually listened to the podcast, just made assumptions uh, based on a tweet uh, around the podcast. But, um, you know, there was uh, Bloomberg claiming they had new evidence, uh, another source um, that uh, – uh, you see Appelbaum, uh, another security expert, who basically was like, okay, he had been doing a, a you know, a uh, he had been working for a telecom company and found, um, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, he had he had uh, found basically more evidence. Um, I want to say in the form of a modified or a non-standard Ethernet port. Um, and it's been interesting because there's been a lot of people like, see, China, and there's been a lot of people who are basically saying this is a fake story. Um, you know, how do you know yeah, this is legit? I think, um, I think what's pushing it in the fake direction is like the, just the, I don't know what the right way to phrase it is, but the denials from companies that have been like, not super micro, but the denials from like Apple and, you know, right. companies that have worked and had this hardware supposedly like the denials are very clear and very like worded in such a way where there there's presumably no fear that that's the story is actually the other way right it's like a very well, categorical just flat out denial of like no sort of uh sort of statements as opposed to yeah like you know there's really no interpretation being left in them right uh now well, I, don't, was, I don't know I mean, why it just you know I mean, that was one of the things that saying? kind of fascinated Ryan and I uh, when we were talking last week was, you know, Apple had had written out this incredibly detailed 
kind of of you know like this is a you know this is not true hasn't happened never did um and just the level for you know this is the kind of thing that apple would normally just quietly ignore and you know go go look at the notch on the phone he was alone um, right but they right. had gone and just like it was just a very long detailed response to this um so one of my favorite takes on this uh came out of vice's uh, motherboard their their technology coverage uh the cybersecurity world is debating. WTF is going on with Bloomberg's Chinese microchip stories. Uh, Jason Calva, Joseph Cox, and Lorenzo Franceschi, Picciarai, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, and I apologize, Lorenzo. Not that I know you well enough to call you Lorenzo, but, uh, quote, no one is really sure who to believe after Business Week's bombshell story on an alleged Chinese supply chain attacking against Apple, Amazon, and others. Um Part of what was crazy about that that secondary story they brought in, uh, where the security researcher talked about the telecom, is like every telecom, uh, like I want to say like Verizon and ATT and everybody else immediately uh, did sort of press releases about it. It just wasn't us, um, and it's been kind of crazy to watch the response to this. Supermicro uh, stock tanked, um, and before anybody's like, oh, this is somebody trying to short super micro stock. Um, this, you know, the, the level of resources it would take to put together a story like this, um, it's really curious because there seems to be enough sort of, uh, just a lot of effort and a lot of people, um, you know, and you could also yeah. argue that, well, they didn't, uh, uh, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't name any names, but that's not exactly unusual in a story of this type, but, uh, you know, just the, uh, like you know, just this the, week, just where the just where the story was, the magnitude right. of the impact of the story, because, you know, case in point, what happened to Supermicro stock as soon as the story went up. Right. That's there's your reason right. that you're getting quick and detailed statements out of related companies. Right. Like, right. So that's, you know, that makes sense so far. Uh, but, yeah, it's definitely a standout just how, you know, much of a flat out denial those statements have been. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 kind of curious about where this one ends up because this is you know you don't really see this is just I don't know it's the legs on this story have been kind of crazy and uh, yeah here it is uh, Sprint, ATD, Verizon, and T-Mobile deny being the quote U.S. telecom unquote mentioned in today's Bloomberg story alleging compromised supermicro hardware. Um, you know the yeah. It's, and like, is that uh, the actual chip? Because I don't even know what you accomplish with three pins. Like, where where are you putting those? I don't know. I'm just saying. Like, yeah, I haven't seen. I want to see more detail about this supposed chip, right? <laughs> like, I think maybe that's what's driving people to go. It's fake because, like, there, you need more than just a story about it. If it's a thing that we know is a chip that was like, we want to know what was it doing to those things, right? Like, you know. Yeah, like that's a generalized, like pictogram style, you know, here's how mm -hmm. the chip was put into things, right? Like, I want to see some pictures of the actual hardware and like, you know, <laughs> here's the chip, like, here's what it was connected to, that sort of thing. I think that's what would help solidify it, you know, or at least back it up um, Yeah, for me, right? Like, so there's, yeah, there's like, oh, it has six pins. Okay. Hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Krebs on security. Well, you know, uh, I thought it was interesting. Like Krebs on security did a, a pretty big response. Uh, I, I mean, he's one of my favorite security writers. Um, you know, the uh, he's you know he says, "quote I heard similar allegations earlier this year about Supermicro and tried mightily to verify them, but could not. That in itself should be zero gauge of the story's potential merit. After all, I am just one guy. Whereas this is the type of scoop that usually takes entire portions of a newsroom to research, report, and vet. By Bloomberg's own account, the story took more than a year to report and write, and cites 17 anonymous sources as confirming the activity." Unquote. Um, so that's, uh, um, you know. And one of the things that that Krebs points out is is you know the U.S. government uh, uh, has um, uh, you know there's an unofficial uh, the brown list or the black list the entity list uh, but basically companies that are and I quote on the permanent stuff list of Uncle Sam for having been caught pulling some kind of supply chain shenanigans um, 
and there's a whole bunch of tech uh, companies on that list. So, um, you know, it's, you know, this is, suspect, you know, this uh, is... I suspect Supermicro is on that list. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly not, but, you know, but, but part but of the problem before. is... It, <laughs> I mean, but but part of the issue with this is is Supermicro makes a lot of equipment, you know, a lot of specialized motherboards for a lot of companies. And yeah, that's um, true. I don't know. It's uh, we will continue to cover it. Uh, there are lots of people that say this is bull stuff. Um, there are lots of people who say this is uh, you know intense and important. And uh, uh, I have this funny feeling that it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, because it seems like anybody who can or might have evidence on this isn't allowed to talk about it or is afraid of talking about it. So, um, yeah. you know, because part of the problem also is that it's uh, part of the problem also is that, it's, you know, vetting hardware uh, is, you know, next to impossible. Um, there's just too much going on that. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of secondary, you know, there's I, I don't know. It's. A lot of people that are questioning uh, the validity of this. It's an interesting story. Certainly uh, looks to be a fairly intensely researched story. So uh, uh, I we'll imagine see. there will definitely be more to follow on this story. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we should take a moment to thank our sponsor, ladies and gentlemen, this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by ExpressVPN, which I'm using on another computer right over there right now. Now, I use it at home because sometimes you do stuff, and I just don't feel like my ISP knowing exactly what I do. Maybe I'm, I'm running something in the background that it just it feels sensitive. And if you're in a cafe or a hotel, you should be running a VPN just to make sure if you're using that public Wi-Fi, that public accessible network, that, that your comms are a little more secure than they would be otherwise. It um, doesn't matter if you're in a Starbucks or a hotel. A hacker with the right know-how can just kind of start sucking down packets and trying to figure out what's going on. To protect, uh, you know, I've been using ExpressVPN since they became a sponsor. Um, easy to use apps. They run in the background of your computer. You turn it on and off with a big virtual button on the app. And the idea is that it's very simple. It secures and anonymizes your internet browsing, encrypts your data, hides your public IP address, basically creates a tunnel. That's what that virtual private network is when we're talking about VPNs. It's, it's your own private tunnel inside the internet from your computer to one of ExpressVPN servers. Um, you know, if you're worried about public Wi-Fi, a VPN is going to help make you more secure. ExpressVPN was rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar. Comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Costs less than 7 bucks a month. If you want a little more privacy, if you want a little more security, a VPN is a good thing to have in your life. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free with a one-year package at expressvpn.com slash twitch. That's expressvpn.com slash twitch for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash twitch to learn more. Meanwhile, uh, as I continue circling my uh, my sub-250 millimeter uh, GPU for my next build, uh, Gigabyte, uh, is advancing the cause of the RTX 2080, the Extreme 8G Customs Graphics Card, will, which will not remotely fit uh, inside of the case uh, that I am building. Um, Turing nope. GPU, uh, better power delivery, the uh, <laughs> Gigabyte's Wind Force Stack 3X cooler, uh, and not one, not two, not five, but seven display outputs on the back of that card that's yep. a lot of display outputs um one of three them, one of that vr specific output i think right the virtual link yeah usb yeah, type C link. connection um yeah three display port three hdmi uh and you can use up to four display ports or hdmi outputs along with the virtual link output simultaneously um I like the fact that there's uh, LEDs in the power connectors that uh, give you state and error codes. Um, RGB LEDs around the fans and the Aorus logo with 12, 12 preset lighting patterns. Um, mm. We don't have clock speed information for the uh, T104 GPU. Um, eight gigabytes of memory, 250. It's basically, you know, it's a 2080, but better. <laughs> yep. Do we have and way way thicker? Like that's uh basically three yeah. shots. You know, 
also will not fit in the case I am building. Uh, pricing information I don't think is available either, but I feel like it's going to be spendy. I mean, it's it's probably like 50 or 100 over NVIDIA's price, like their mm -hmm. price of the reference card. But granted, that price is kind of high too. I think it's, what, 800 for those? Mm-hmm. Uh, for the 2080s, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're definitely up there, and I don't, I don't see them coming down anytime soon, unfortunately. Well, you know, they got some inventory to clear out. <coughs> Something I didn't uh, expect either: uh, Threadripper 2790 WX and 2920X availability with a new dynamic local mode feature. Um, it's basically more second-generation Threadripper CPUs, 12 and 24-core variants. Um, Kind of the the two big ones uh, were the twenty nine ninety WX that's thirty two core sixty four thread uh, thread ripper, um, but basically now they've got thirty two sixty four twenty four forty eight sixteen thirty two and twelve twenty four IE uh, two steps in between one step below the twenty nine fifty X and one yep. step above the twenty nine fifty X. The more uh, interesting is um, if you're, if you're trying to use your your. Granted, these are meant for like workstation machines, but the idea is you can do other stuff. Uh, you don't have to do nothing but workstation things. Maybe you want to fire up a game on your workstation. Maybe you want to use an application that's not necessarily like a workstation-y kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there were some disadvantages to this particular architecture. Actually, if you look at that block diagram, although it's a little bit confusing, the idea is that there were four dies within the package of the CPU, and only two of those dies were connected to memory. Uh, so, and, and your PCI devices as well. Um, so basically that meant that half of the cores within this whole Ryzen you know, CPU as a whole, uh, half of the cores had some form of a direct connection to the system resources, while the other half of the cores had to go over the fabric, no matter what, uh, mm -hmm. to do those communications. So ideally, if you had like, a, you know, if I had a, a choice of where would you want these threads to run, uh, chances are you'd want to stick with the ones that had their own, you know, memory directly connected to them and whatnot. Right. Um, so the catch was, this is kind of like too many layers deep, probably on what the, at least the, the window scheduler is designed to handle. Like you can handle, you know, UMA and NUMA and that this memory is connected to this CPU over here and this other bank of memory is connected to this other you know, CPU over here, and there's there's different layers to how the scheduler can can like prioritize things. Um, but once you start getting to the point where like, well, half of the half of the cores are not connected to any memory. Well, now it's like you know they probably have to probably have to add this in as yet another layer to how the scheduler is programmed uh, in the Windows kernel. Uh, I think Linux already has some you know concessions or provisions for 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 this kind of a layout already. Uh, and can work around it. Windows mm -hmm. will, takes longer than Linux, obviously, to you know to do those kinds of kernel level um, updates. But AMD has kind of a workaround, um, which is this thing called a dynamic local mode. So it is basically a piece of software that runs. Uh, it's just it's part of the just the the software suite, I think, or at least they're adding it. Um, but what it does is it it just kind of like observes what threads are running and on what cores they are running on in the system. Uh, and it, it most likely it just does it by kind of like a manually setting affinity at the thread level, which you can do in Windows. It's just, it helps if you have a program doing it for you. So this kind of like attempts to do a little bit of micromanaging on what threads uh, or which cores the threads are, are being moved to or running on in the first place. So... If you do something like that on a processor like this, uh, and you know less likely that a thread will get stuck on a core that doesn't have its own memory connected directly to it, uh, you can get some performance boost out of that. Um, you know, makes sense. Uh, and, and, and the end result is probably bringing it more in line with a processor that didn't have you know that disadvantage to it, right? Like this is this right. is sort of a catch. Like you, you're basically running an epic processor in a desktop, so. There has to be some concessions made, uh, and those concessions are that, well, you don't get to connect RAM to all four dies. You have to you know, only connect it to two, right? Um, which puts you at a little bit of a disadvantage compared to just you know, standard Ryzen kind of 
CPU that didn't have that, that, that kind of a segmentation, right? So good on AMD for, um, you know, for coming up with uh, that sort of a solution or at least an attempt of a solution to the problem. And it might end up being something, I don't know if the whole suite will be, but maybe like just some subset of this, just the part uh, that does the dynamic local mode thing. Maybe that'll eventually just ship as like a part of Windows, right? Because you already have, uh, mm -hmm. I think the Intel tool is either built in or it downloads on its own as part of like a driver pull for like, um, I forget the name of the Intel tool, but there's the one that does the, you know, uh, most favorite core, right? For like overclocking. Right. And, uh, you know, is able to kind of like, you, you have to do something at the OS level to like kind of translate that and communicate that and make sure that the threads in the OS are favoring one particular core that happens to be the fastest one. Um, same kind of thing can apply for AMD. It just has to eventually, you know, hopefully just work its way into Windows so you don't have to install an extra thing once you've, once you've, uh, installed your OS for the first time. Or, you know, if it's just part of the AMD suite, chances are people are installing that anyway because it has a bunch of other overclocking features and, you know, other things that people are probably wanting to use anyway if you're on AMD. Mm -hmm. It makes yeah, sense. Cool stuff. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of cool stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm laughing because I wanted to, I was about to jump ahead to uh, uh, what may be the most ridiculous uh, <clears throat> Headset we've heard of oh. in a long time, but let's talk about uh, <laughs> the HyperX RGB. If you can't make your flash faster, if you can't make your flash faster, you can make yeah, your yeah. fast flashier. Um, yeah, which I could have sworn uh, was was all you. But that was actually Jeremy uh, Hellstrom. Um, essentially, Project Unicorn Vomit has uh, an SSD option. Project Uniform Unicorn Vomit being my affectionate name for the all. Uh, just basically the idea of how many LEDs can we pack inside of a single uh, suffering case, uh, but RGB to the HyperX Fury SSD lines. Um, any thoughts on this uh, performance-wise yeah, so was versus a, uh, LEDs? I mean, it, it's it's a good SATA SSD. Just happens mm -hmm. to have uh, RGB LEDs built into it and a four-pin, I think it's a four-pin header um, built into it, so you can attach it you know, an extra cable gets attached to the SSD and then gets attached to if your motherboard has uh, pin header outs for driving, uh, you know, L RGB LED strips or whatnot. You can just mm -hmm. plug it into this instead and control that from your motherboard or from anything that can drive, you know, the four pin type um, RG you know, RGB LED strips. Um, yeah, uh, we have one. Uh, I'm testing it. I don't know that the team group one actually had like, it was multiple channels. I want to say it was like maybe eight channels worth across the front mm -hmm. of it. So you can actually have like if you had a cycling pattern or something, it would actually roll across uh, the front of the SSD. Uh, I imagine the Kingston ones, uh, the HyperX ones, probably similar. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if if you want the SSD to look cool, like you know, and you're into the RGB thing, yeah, you know, it it works. And I haven't seen uh, the Team Group one actually impressed me. Uh, like it performed reasonably well for for a SATA SSD. I was kind of expecting well, it to be gimmicky just because it had RGBs on it and was like, oh yeah, it'll <laughs> probably just be a joke as far as performance goes. No, right. this is you know good, good solid performing SATA SSD. Um, you know, I I, I would be shocked if uh, the HyperX brand launched a, a you know a subpar SATA SSD at this point, uh, given all their their previous releases. So, you know, right. I just took a good good SSD and. Add some RGBs to it. Light the thing up. <laughs> you know, I like HyperX. I mean, make I, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I like the look I of it. Kingston like it's cool what they did with the. Yeah, it's it's cool what they did with the you know with the cutout there and how it lights up. The, uh, I'm just hits. glad that it's. Well, no, but it, you know, it's it's just it's nice when you have bling that doesn't necessarily compromise the performance. Um, of yeah. the device you're building, so I'm just yes, saying. I'm okay. With, I'm okay with blinging it out as long as it doesn't make it worse. <laughs> you know, that's that's my that's my threshold, right? As long as it's still Shannon, good performance. Can, yeah, I mean, basically, I can tell yeah. Shannon she can go ahead and buy the the fantastic RGB encrusted, inladen, packed. 
Man, 960 yep. gigabytes, two hundred thirty-four dollars and ninety-nine cents. One terabyte SSDs are kind of cheap right now. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, Especially SATA. G Skill, by the way. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So there's so this G Skill memory. There is RGBs on it. Right. But don't let that throw you. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is actually doing something else. That's that's pretty interesting. So the idea is, uh, say you wanted to make a small form factor motherboard that only <laughs> had a couple of dim slots on it, right? right. Uh, but you wanted to be able to put the capacity, uh, you know, the amount of memory installed into this board. Uh, you'd want to do something that would previously have been limited to a memory kit that would require four dim slots, right? Sure. So you're trying to fit four dim slots worth of memory into two dim slots. How do you do that? Well, uh, you know, most like the Intel platforms is dual channel memory controller, meaning there's two memory channels, there's two sets of address and data buses. They're going, they might be split between a pair of physical slots for each channel, giving you four slots total. Uh, you could just kind of rearrange like how the electrical connections are done. And you can, if you kind of cram uh, twice as much memory onto a given DIM uh, mm -hmm. and you were creative with how you wired a couple of the pins. Uh, and if the motherboard was aware of it, which it has to be for this to work, uh, you could basically make four DIM slots worth of memory fit into two. You just have to kind of modify the spec a little bit uh, to kind of work around a couple of logical things that have to change. And that's what's going on here. Um, so the idea is you have a two DIM kit mm -hmm. uh, and you can get 64 gig into a system with only two DIMs. Nice. It clocked, clocked at a decent speed. So this is up to like 3.2 gigahertz. Um, you know, the timings look decent. It's just, you know, there's no, there's no real trickery. It's just they're kind of... You know, I don't know if the if JDEC is going to turn this into an actual spec. I'd imagine they probably will at some point, um, but they're kind of like, you know, just taking a step ahead of the game here. Uh, so just realize if you if you pick this memory up, there is a limited number of motherboard like motherboard support is required. The stuff will not work, or I'd imagine if you plugged it in anyway, you'd probably only see half of the memory that was available. Um, which would be kind of a waste of money given RAM prices uh, currently. So, yeah, if you have a need to fit uh, an insane amount of memory into a small form factor system that only has two slots, uh, there is now a way to do it. And it only works with a few of the Z390 uh, boards, specifically from Asus. Uh, we haven't heard anybody else doing it yet, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So it's Asus for the boards and then uh, G Skill. For the memory, very specific Got subset it. of parts. It's almost like that 28 core Xeon workstation uh, CPU that only works with two mother, one maybe two motherboards, right? <laughs> Same kind of thing. Well, you know, it's nice to not have to sort through the 34, you know, individual motherboard options from each of six manufacturers. Also, also true. Yes, it would be nice to go on like you know Newegg or something and sort by specific thing and then only get. <laughs> <laughs> Two results as like oh, you only get to use pick one or the other. Yes. Oh my goodness. Somebody uh, I should have pointed out that uh, HyperX Fury RGB SSD, um, you know, is actually kind of spendy for a one terabyte. The, at two hundred twenty dollars uh, for a, a one terabyte or just under one terabyte SATA three uh, SSD, um, that compares to like a Crucial MX five hundred at one hundred and sixty bucks or a Samsung eight sixty Evo. For 167 bucks, so uh, a Western Digital Blue 3D NAND one terabyte PC SSD for 150 bucks. Um, yep. So uh, you know you are paying not quite a 50 percent, maybe a 40 percent VIG for those uh, LEDs on the HyperX Fury. Just yeah. want to get the HyperX that out one there. is it's. I mean it's it's they're going for I think a little bit more of a premium kind of thing. Just look at the build of the thing, right? They're they're going super mm -hmm. fancy on it. So that's yeah, you know. It's meant to be more of a showy thing. You, the person probably willing to throw in an extra 50 bucks to let their SSD have glowy bits, I guess. 
the team group, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the team group RGB SSD, like it, it wasn't as spendy, uh, probably similar performance. It was, you know, decent mm -hmm. performing SSD. But yeah, I mean, the HyperX, you know, you're partially paying for the name. You're paying a little bit of a premium because you're going to put that in a system with a uh, HyperX keyboard, mouse, headset, you know, all synchronized in unison color as they're, uh, as they're cycling through their colors. Yeah. Yeah. We should, uh, I want to give a shout out on this one. Um, <laughs> I found out about this a few weeks ago and reviews are just uh, starting to come out. Uh, I've been looking at a, a fairly high end, uh, headset that I'm a little disappointed with, but, uh, uh, at the same time, somebody's like, have you heard that HP is doing a, a cooling headset and it's the Omen mind frame. Um, windows central, uh, did a review, the verge did a review. Um, and essentially, they put uh, thermoelectric coolers or Peltier coolers um, in these so that they literally uh, cool off the inside of the ear cup. And, uh, okay, that's uh, cool. you know, it's, it's cool. Uh, I mean, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, you Except know, for the price. Then you get to the price. For your ears. <laughs> yeah, the price is like $200. And something that I've run into with several headsets, you know, there's, there's a couple issues, right? They're, they're, there's no... Uh, there's no volume control for the mic on these. You can only adjust the level on the headphones. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, there's an off, high, medium, and low settings for it that you run off of the uh, control software. Um, the Verge points out uh, two things. One, you can't turn off the 7.1 virtual sound off ever, which I think is a big no-no for a gaming headset. Because a lot of games do not do well with the 7.1 artificial 7.1 or, or synthetic 7.1 surround sound. Uh, and number two. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, the general con consensus is that, uh, the audio is pretty miserable, uh, you know, uh, possibly because of the, you know, inclusion of the refrigerators, the cooling plates in there. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, it's, the mic's not bad, but you get a giant beep, uh, when you put the mic in the mute position, which is really irritating. Um, the uh you know the the sound performance is is uh, you know i i i like uh, uh you know i like how kind of specific uh uh stefan etienne got on the verge where he's basically just you know you can get better audio for a lot less money um but it's unfortunate because there's it's one of the things we keep running into in gaming headsets over and over again where they're they've done a lot of interesting things uh but they haven't really bothered to um uh, you know, do a good job on the audio. Uh, and another thing I've, I've kind of noticed, for example, the windowscentral.com has some issues with the audio, but they still say the audio quality is above average. And for me, what's really frustrating is realizing that a lot of the people who are like, this sounds amazing, have never actually heard their regular gaming uh, sound through, you know, even an inexpensive but quality uh, set of headphones. Um, but uh, if you do have hot, sweaty ears, and cooling off your ears is a massive priority or would make your life a lot better. Uh, keep an eye out for the HP Open Mind Frame. Uh, and it's kind of painful $200 price. Um, the other thing that amused me is uh, Hard OCP reminded me. The announcement kind of came out of nowhere in the middle of September. And uh, I feel like we didn't talk about this, but I want to make sure we did. Uh, Whirlwind FX <laughs> is the company. Yeah. Vortex is the device. Um, and uh, I, I love this description. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I like my words. The, the world's first environmental simulator for PC gaming. PC peripheral instantly adds immersion and intensity to any game or multimedia experience. And uh, so the idea is that... Uh, uh, what what air kills me here is... Th this is this is like just straight up ripping off. What is it? The Magnavox commercial? Memorex. Is it live or, Memorex? or is it Memorex? Is it yeah. live? Or, yeah. Like it's, uh, that's just funny. Like they, they went, they went exactly for it there. They weren't even holding back. Yeah. I mean, this was announced back at CES 2018. I want to say, you know, um, you know, it's 120 bucks. Uh, the reviews on it have been kind of amusing. Um, uh, I'm going to quote, uh, you know, it's adding some sensory stuff. Yeah, which so, is nothing you know, wrong with that. 
Quote, when it yeah. correctly identifies the environment, the vortex delivers an incredible layer of realism. In Battlefield, I felt the heat from a burning tank and gusts of air as vehicles passed. Similarly, the vortex responded to the opening mountain climbing scene and rise of the Tomb Raider as though it were made for it, delivering bursts of air whenever the on-screen wind picked up. <clears throat> However, there was still a disconnect since the cool air isn't as intense as a snowy chill or even a refrigerator. Meanwhile, the heat can be intense, but not uncomfortably so. The device was less impressive with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The Vortex seemed to be confused by the underwater sequences, firing puffs of warm air while Lara was swimming. Um, so uh, it also intermittently swimming doesn't, delivered puffs of Swimming air. doesn't blow hot air in your face. No, and apparently it sort of randomly puffs warm air even when there's nothing going on in, in a lot of games. So, um, hmm. uh, I mean, maybe handy you know. in the winter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it's an interesting concept. Um, you know, one of the things is apparently as it kind of warms up over time, it becomes less. Uh, uh, it becomes less capable of delivering cool air. I'm tempted to get one into review just because it's so odd. Uh, and then I just had, I realized I kind of had to figure out like which one, what game I would actually test it with. Cause you know, rocket league, yeah. I'm not exactly, uh, hurting for warm puffs of air in my face. So I'll find something right. to test it with, but, um, 120 bucks, uh, USB connection. It's out there. If you're looking for a more immersive, uh, immersive gaming environment, um, so you, you guys are basically testing a whole bunch of new Intel processors. Uh, Ryan's on his way back from somewhere, somehow. Yep. Uh, yep. The uh, anything you can tease that's going on at PC Per? I mean, it's you know, just expect uh, some of that uh, Intel content soon. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's the that's the bee's knees right now. That's the big the stuff coming bee's up. Bee's knees. He's oh these. my goodness! We had uh, a lot of been, fun. Uh, Ken has been rapidly uh, lapping the office behind, like around in front of me. He keeps like <laughs> running back and forth, just testing various things. There's sparks flying testing all like over the, the place. Oh yes, my goodness! Just like the wind. Don't burn the lab down while Ryan's not there. Just That's saying. Okay. Oh my goodness! Uh, we've talked about uh, we had a viewer that was actually looking for the best television but they didn't want anything bigger than 43 inches which is kind of fun um because you ne you, you never get people asking for smaller televisions um and i will say if you can fit a 55 inch television over a 43 inch television do it um shannon took a look at acer's predator helios 300 special edition gaming laptop which has uh, gold uh and then uh, we had an extended conversation with um my friend Will Smith, um, he does Foo VR. He used to run Tested. Um, he is deeply involved in the VR lifestyle. He basically creates VR content for a living. Uh, and we talked about the Oculus Quest and how it compares to the Go and the Rift and the HTC Vive. And if you should be, you know, kind of like when you should make the decision to wait for a Quest versus buying uh, a, uh, a Rift or a Go now. So if you've been thinking about VR for this holiday season, uh, it's definitely worth taking a look at that one. That's TechThing198 up at techthing.com. And uh, later on today, I'll be recording uh, my new, uh, my latest AV Excel with Robert Heron, where we'll talk about televisions and speakers and home theater. And uh, some of there's a little bit of news that came out of Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, but mostly I just wish I'd heard some of the insane $75,000 speakers that are on display at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest because I find things like that amusing, uh, especially when I can find a $500 speaker that sounds almost as good. It's a life goal, people. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Twit.tv slash TWICH is the place to find all of our older episodes, links on how to subscribe, the RSS feed. Um, I highly recommend if you haven't been to twit.tv slash twitch, head on over there. You'll find some fine technical podcasting, especially if you're looking for hardware news. You can find Mr. Alan Malventano, a.k.a. at Malventano, over at PCPer.com. You can find me at Patrick Norton on the Twitters or at, uh, of course, I mentioned that tech thing or AVXL. And uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for listening to the podcast and being a part of it. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Alan Malventano. We'll catch you next week on Twitch.